You are on the Frenzy Feed. The, the Professor, Professor Frenzy, Frenzy Show! Professor Frenzy, it's a show. Professor Frenzy Show. Professor Frenzy, it's a show. Professor Frenzy Show. Hello, and welcome to the Professor Frenzy Show, episode 280. My name is Jerry. And I'm Chris. And we are your hosts. On the Professor Frenzy Show, we are going to try to spotlight some smaller publishers' comics that we think deserve some attention. We aren't going to read or score comics. We aren't really even going to be reviewing comics. We're just going to talk about some that we think people should consider reading. So, Chris, did you read any good comics this week? Well, yes, Professor. As a matter of fact, I sure did. <laughs> professor, not a lot quantity-wise, but mm -hmm. I have to say, for the most part, for the most part, some really good quality. Yeah. And I can't wait to dive into this first one that we yeah. both looked at. This was really intriguing. This was one of my co-reads of the week. I'm not sure if it was for you. It's called The Deviant, number mm -hmm. one from Image Comics, written by James Tynan the fourth. Thank you, Professor Allen. Art done by Joshua Hickson, and it was five ninety nine, but it was slightly higher page count. Professor, I'll let you take the floor and discuss it, and I will join in because I'm really dying to hear your thoughts afterward. You betcha. So, in current day Chicago, a writer named Michael remembers a serial killer of several people, including children, back when he was a kid. The killer's name was Randall Olson, and he dressed as Santa as he killed. Randall was caught and is in prison, and Michael goes to prison to interview him. Now, Randall is a gay man, but he, he insists that he didn't have sex with his victims. Now, Michael is also gay. His first memory of homosexuality being a thing is remembering back, you know, that hearing that a lot of his friends thought that the killer was having sex with the with their the victims and he was like you mean boys having sex with boys and it kind of opened his mind so he's kind of coming from his sexuality is coming kind of from a strange uh, a very unique place let's put it that way uh now he goes to interview this guy and you know they have some back and forth but back in the modern day it looks like a new killer santa is on the loose. Hmm, I wonder what's going to go on there. This was an intense story, and a lot did happen, but really a lot of the, the content of the book, which was definitely, you know, a longer page count, uh, you know, had a lot of, uh, you know, the background was very sexual. It was about the sexual awakening of this kid and, you know, I presume how it affects him, how it affects him in the modern day, and how it's going to affect him going forward. This is a slow burn book. It has the page count to take its time. And I really think it's fascinating. And the thing that kind of hooked me is thinking about where Tynan is going with this idea of that, you know, this first realization of that something called gay people exist is attached to this murder. If it was another writer, I would worry about this. Like, you know, where is this going? What is this uh, writer trying to say about, you know, homosexuality and murder and, you know, the the entanglement of these things? But Tynan is a darn good writer, and I really trust him, and I feel confident that he has a really compelling idea here, and it definitely feels like a compelling idea. Um, you, you mentioned you didn't know how I, how I, uh, what I thought about this book, and this is definitely my read of the week, um, both with the writing and Hickson's art. I'm a big fan of Hickson. Uh, and this art is fantastic. It's eerie. It's shadowy. It's very dark with the ever-present distraction of snowflakes, you know, and a lot of the outdoor scenes and just ever-present danger. Um, and I really dug this book. I am dying to hear what you thought about The Deviant, number one, Chris. Thanks, Prof. This is my co-read of the week. I'll get to my other co-read of the week in a moment. But yeah, this was a really, really, really effective creepy book and it's disturbing and i i want to put some possible and potential trigger yeah. alerts out there for some people who are just taken aback by some of the things because it almost struck me too on a personal level in the mid to the late 70s in the detroit area there was a <laughs> there was a killer serial killer known as the oakland county child killer and mm -hmm. he one of his victims struck are actually around christmas time where one of the there was a girl victim who ran away from home and the, everywhere in the news, we were wondering if this victim would be found. And we just happened to be visiting 
relatives at the time. Mm. And there there were some similarities to this particular case. Uh, there were four victims attributed to this killer. Two were girls, two were boys. And if I'm not mistaken, um, there, there was some hints of uh, some sexual activity with the boy victims, not the female victims. Mm. So it really, really struck a nerve with me as someone who was a child living around that time and had some familiarity with the greater Detroit area with respect to that. So I am going to put some trigger alerts out there because it's a sensitive topic for yeah. people who know of the case and who lived lived in that area and lived through it at the time. It, it was a very unnerving thing. I can't help but draw some comparison contrast to that. And with that said, I did enjoy the deviate. I thought it was cleverly written. I liked that we get a lot of nuances and layer to the book. Randall seems to be a complex character and some of the things that he does and says is a real, real creepiness thing. And it again brings up some, some, some similarities, pardon my stuttering to some of who the potential suspects were in the Oakland County case. So I'm wondering if uh, Tyna maybe was familiar with it, but if it, if it was a clean slate for him just to come up with this, he did a masterful job, but I'd really like to know what some of his sources and parades, inspiration was for this particular book yeah. it is a creepy book i like the christmas setting the artwork was gorgeous hickson did a really mm. really masterful job with respect to that as did everybody from soup to nuts with a creative team this had an ominous feel to it the book also did an interesting take where it is an extra page count but as i was going through it the first half of the book is very very fast there's not a lot of narrative there's just mm -hmm. a lot of pictures a lot of panel work with uh, concise and tight verticals and horizontals, but very little dialogue. The dialogue mostly comes in the second half of the story. And I, I kind of enjoyed the pivot because we, we sort of had a nice ride along with setting the table nicely with the setting and the flashback and the, then the present day. We have many, many complex characters here as with Michael and his, his journey with self-discovery with respect to this as well. And the way Randall can assess and take up Michael and just in the limited time that he spends with him, he knows exactly what Michael is. At least I'm led to think so. And that kind of unnerves him a little bit, mm -hmm. that he knows more about <laughs> him than he does himself. And it, it's a very telling thing. Uh, I don't want to necessarily compare and contrast to that but it's almost a little bit of a head game and and, and mm. it's a head game kind of contrasting to when clarice starling's character meets hannibal lecter in the yeah. film silence of the lambs you when that initial exchange happens i mean hannibal's in there yet he knows a little bit more about clarice than she does himself and he gets clarice to talk about herself in a way she doesn't want to and you could just see that gratification that uh lecter's character has with it so i think there's an interesting dynamic here where you can complain contra and contrast those two scenes and really get a real creepy vibe with those things. They build up a lot of tension. Now, the film does it a lot more better and spends a lot of time on it. The comic book still gave me that impact in the limited space and the limited confinements that a comic book can, and I have to really applaud that. That was a masterful scene, and how they executed it in the short span it had was mm. really, really well done. I mean, this was this is like, you know... Uh, master's class in comic book storytelling and with is. the way it was pulled off a huge huge creepy vibe in that I, I i've also neglected the scene where <laughs> we had some of the law enforcement going after the killer after the killer and it's dark and it's snowy and there's another creepy tension scene there that i don't want to spoil this book has a lot of great scenes in it and it was one of my reads of the week however i have to put a trigger alert out there this could be very disturbing for a particular reader if some of the events of uh, child abductions sort of could potentially unnerve you. I am putting that out there as a trigger alert. So be, be careful. But I did find the deviant to be a well, well executed comic book from top to bottom. Yeah. And one of the thing I, I've neglected to mention was um, Hickson's colors, especially oh, the city colors at night, you know, with the um, Christmas displays with all the, the, the reds and the greens. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. Indeed. Totally, totally, totally. Book. So those were our thoughts and impressions <laughs> on The Deviant. This was the first issue. It was priced at five ninety nine, and it is a book for mature readers. Yes. 
Next up, we both looked at Project Cryptid, number three yeah. from Ahoy Comics. Uh, Bryce Ingman and Paul Constant as our writing team. And then we also had uh, Peter Cross. Uh, Professor, once again, they we were uh, treated to two stories. I will let you take the floor, and then we'll talk about it. All right. Yeah, we get two cryptids, neither of which I've ever heard of. So uh, we see the Loveland Frogman. And it turns out he's a four-foot-tall frogman that helps out the folks of Loveland, Ohio. He has electricity powers. I didn't know frogs had that, but he's got it. And so he carries sticks around that he transmits the electricity through. So, like, for example, if your car battery is dead, you know, the frogman shows up. He's going to be able to help you out. Uh, now, there was a man who was never helped by the frogman, and he went through a lot of things in his life, and he's upset. You know, eh, the frogman helps everybody. He never helped me. And he decides he's going to hunt the frogman. So he goes out with his gun, and he Elmer fuds it into the woods, and uh, he finds the frogman. But the frogman's in trouble. He's got a tree on his leg, and, whoa, you know, he's trapped. And it's easy for him to shoot him, but he doesn't. He doesn't shoot him. He, he ends up helping him out. And I thought it was a sweet little silly little story that I really liked. Now, the second story is about the Gumbaroo, which is kind of like a bearded bear-like cryptid of the Pacific Northwest. So we see a pioneer family travel from Maine to the Northwest Territories, and they go to build a homestead. But the husband, Carl, is lazy and kind of a jerk, and Edith, his wife, she suffers along with him. He's always telling her she's dumb and, yeah, you know, I'll get a, I'll get us a cabin built. Don't you worry. And there's no cabin and they're still, you know, going to have to spend the winter in a tent if he doesn't do it. So she, you know, is risking freezing, but she's still supporting her husband. Uh, so Carl is also obsessed with the local uh, Native Americans and he's afraid that they're going to come and mess with them. So these cryptids, these what they they call them the bungaroos, they show up and they're they first they scare them, but it turns out they're nice creatures, but are very susceptible to fire. So Carl decides he wants to set them up with dynamite and then run them into where the natives are and blow them up. But Edith stops that plan and Carl gets his. It turns out that Edith has the hope of a decent life without him and with the bungaroos. So I thought that was fun. Uh, I think this is an interesting book. The stories are kind of flimsy. I mean, both of these stories are, are barely stories. They're definitely Shutter Magazine kind of level of, uh, of uh, plot. But, uh, you know, you like the people. It's fun going along. I love seeing the frogman and the guy talking to the, you know, hunting the frogman. And um, Edith, you know, trying to deal with her stupid husband. It's a light, breezy, fun book that talks about cryptids, and I like it. What did you think about Project Cryptid number three, Chris? Thanks, Professor. Like you, I was unfamiliar with these cryptids, and every time I make a note to myself to investigate any actuality if these things <laughs> were purported to exist in their respective areas where they claim to have uh, traversed, I came into this with a lukewarm feeling. Here we go. These will be some quick stories, but I don't know if there's going to be any, quote, meat on the bone. That said, I, I, I really enjoyed this, and I thought I got my money's worth on both stories. I think the first one with the Frogman had a bit of a moral at the end, and I really liked that. I think the second tale had some deserved comeuppance that I didn't see coming. It, it, I had to wait a little bit for the payoff, because I really didn't know which way this story was going to go. And we, we have... <laughs> The husband, who's just this really irredeemable character, and he's just so nasty, and he just is making practic impractical decisions as they're going out <laughs> throughout this way. And we've got a narrator basically writing things down in what it appears to be a diary, and I, I get it. Now we see who it is, and then I, I like how we got a nice little pivot and a scene shift where, okay, this is what's happening, and we get a character that deserves comeuppance, get his comeuppance, and I like mm -hmm. that. So, yeah, it, it was it was fine. I, I think it took me a while to get into the latter story. I, I had more of an engrossed feeling with the first one, but both of the endings were ones that I should have seen coming that I didn't. So for that, I have to applaud it. I don't know. Is my brain getting a little mushy? I'm not sure, because I suppose a more savvy self should have caught these things, but I didn't. As it's an Ahoy book, we did have some text pieces. We had Dibs by Kirk Vanderbeek. 
And then we had another chapter of Partially Naked Came the Corpse by the Ahoy staff. This particular one, Part 10, was written by uh, Turin Gronbeck. Yeah, I liked it. What can I say? This was a, this was a good, <laughs> uh, nice, you, you pay your money, and I, I got my money's worth for this. So I thought I, it was a good comic. Awesome. Okay, those were our thoughts and impressions on Project Cryptid. This was the third issue from Ahoy Comics. It was priced at three ninety nine, and we believe at our own risk, and it is a book for mature <laughs> readers, although I don't know if I saw anything too objectionable myself. Yeah, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> so, Chris, what other books do you read this week? Well, Professor, first at the top of my reading pile this week was the conclusion of Big Game, number mm. five, from Image Comics. This was written by Mark Miller, or done by Pepe the Raz. It was priced at seven ninety nine, and it did have a higher page count. Per the advanced solicit miniseries finale, this is it. The double-length conclusion to the best company crossover in years. We've seen all the beloved Miller World characters together for the first time and watched as Nemesis murdered them one by one. But is there a chink of hope somewhere that he's forgotten about? This book is a must for fans of Kick-Ass, Kingsman, The Magic Order, Nemesis, and all your favorites. End of quote, end of advanced solicit. I don't want to spoil too much here, but I will say this is sort of an all's well, ends well ending. There was a little bit in this where a character seemed to meet their demise. And I said, oh, well, at least Miller had to give us one casualty and I can accept that after everything else laid waste. Now we did the time travel trick resurrecting these characters where Hit Girl goes back, lets people have advanced knowledge of their impending fates and their impending deaths. So if you know your death's coming three days away, you can, and you know who's going to kill you, you can amply prepare for it. That's great. That's I'm trying to really tap dance around this because I don't want to spoil this too much. But I really, really did enjoy it. We had some nice redemption from Kick-Ass being awarded a title of a quote-unquote superhero joining a particular superhero team. There was a little bit of a bait and switch with a death within this scene that I have to say I bought and I would have accepted like I previously stated, but I really like how this was executed. Now, some are probably going to have a quibble with the time travel as being a cheat, but hey, this is Mark Miller's characters and I really have to applaud them for just the thread he put this through and putting all of his characters and taking all of his toys out of his toy box, putting them through their paces and then putting them back again. That's not to say that Nobody comes out of this unscathed, but and they someone does meet their comeuppance in the end, and this really, really was a fun comic book. Mark Miller really grabs my attention. I, I just am kind of kicking myself that I don't know everybody in the whole entire Millerverse. That said, I don't think I had to. I, I was familiar with about half or a little more than half the cast, and I like that. You, if If that's the same boat that you're in with respect to the knowledge of the characters, I don't think you would be disappointed with Big Game. Or even with Miller as a storyteller, you know what you're going to get. There's going to be some uh, graphic stuff here. There's going to be some humor. And this is going to be a comic book's comic book. Big game number five from Image Comics. The finale was priced at $7.99, and it is a book for mature readers. And it will probably make the conversation of my best of 2020-23. Fantastic. Okay. Well, next up, I took a flyer on Animal Pound Ashcan. It's a one-shot from Boom Studios. Written by Tom King, and that's that was enough to make me jump on board with this. Art was done by Peter Gross. It was priced at two ninety nine. Per the advance solicit from the publisher of Slaughterhouse Five, the graphic novel comes a bold reimagining of George Orwell's timeless masterpiece about by two award winning creators working together for the first time. Visionary writer Tom King and acclaimed artist Peter Gross invite readers to experience a modern allegory inspired by Animal Farm. Don't miss out on this exclusive ash can, strictly limited to its initial print run and never to be printed again. Of the series everyone will be talking about for the years to come. Wow, that's a pretty bold statement. But that said, this was my other co-read of the week. Uh, we had two animals in here, an animal pound, one is a dog, one is a cat. They are smart, and they are resigned to the fate of what's happening in this animal pound. Uh, The animals don't come out. At least some of them do. And here are the humans who are able to open doors, and the animals aren't open. And it's just like if you had the talent and the gifts to open a door, the world is yours. And the animals don't have that. There's more to their animal's life than just being fed, being watered, getting a requisite amount of exercise and having their belly scratched. There's a little bit more to life than that, and the animals are sort of seeing that. There is an ominous sense of an accepted fate 
which is really, really heartbreaking to read if you are a pet owner or if you have any semblance of feeling to animals that are caged or kept in a shelter. Another trick alert, this book might not be for you, but at least know that going into it, because I think there's some masterful writing here by Tom King. The art done by Peter Gross is really, really captivating as well. This was in black and white. I presume future issues are going to be in color. I really like that the pivot they did with respect to the animal characters as we will get ours and we will see how this is going to play out. I really didn't make the connection to the animal farm initially, although I should have. And I'm wondering where this is going to go and how it's going to play out with respect to this, with respect to the allegories and everything here. This is a brilliant book. That said, I had a little bit of a quibble because there is a text piece by King in the back of this where he gets a little chest puffy with respect to his talent. And I it kind of rubbed me a little bit the wrong way. But that said, I do have to give him props because it is a brilliant, brilliant read for two ninety nine, and just setting the table up nicely for something that's going to happen here. I think Animal Pound will be on people's radar. But again, I, I do have to put out a trigger alert if you are a pet lover and if you know what happens behind the scenes with respect to some of these places, you may want to just open the door cautiously, knowing that going in. Mm. And those were my thoughts and impressions on Animal Pound. This was an ash can. It was number one. It's just a one shot from Boom Studios, two ninety nine, and it's for mature readers. Fantastic. And then finally, I took a the, looked at the conclusion of Rocketeer and the Den of Thieves, number four from IDW, written by uh, Stefan Mooney and art done by David Messina, four ninety nine. Per the advanced solicit, the sky-searching action pack finale. Cliff is behind enemy lines and face-to-face -face with a full-flying complement of Nazi rocket men. As if that wasn't bad enough, he, along with PV and Betty, have to spoil the Nazis' last dirty trick, an American bomber. A prototype long-range transport equipped and crammed with a squadron of enhanced rocket men, each armed with miniature rocket-propelled bombs, targeting New York. End of quote, end of advanced solicit. Mm -hmm. Okay, this was a slapdash uh, conclusion. With a lot of chase scenes and with some really, really marvelously rendered artwork with respect to uh, the Saturday morning serial action with Cliff and Betty and PV escaping Germany, fighting off rocket men, and then once being in New York City, fending them off again, and the good guys beating the bad guys, all in a slapdash, fast pace, with some uh, allies behind the scenes giving them some aid. What... With all the, the praise and accolades I'm peeping on this, what could I possibly dislike? Well, the only <laughs> thing I didn't like about this was the 10 pages of house ads at the oh. end of this. Um, it was a hit, and especially for a four ninety nine book, I was a little taken aback by that. I love the Rocketeer character. I love the supporting cast of PV and Betty. I love Cliff's Accord. And I'll, I'm always going to pretty much sign up for anything with the Rocketeer character. I think I've got all the appearances. That said... Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'll pick this up and trade. The four ninety nine price point, I thought, was a little excessively high, especially with uh, those 10-page ads. Nonetheless, I, I was there for the artwork, and I didn't sense too much peril overall with this series as some of the latter ones. I did like that Betty had a little bit more to do. I did like that uh, PV was had its moments in the spotlight as well. There was some clever writing here. The artwork I had no quibbles with. Again, it was the page count and the price point. Those are my thoughts and impressions on Rocketeer and the Den of Thieves number four from IDW Publishing. It was four ninety nine. I didn't immediately see a rating on this, but I'd have to say, you know, this is this is stuff for uh, kids and above. Professor, I'll hand it off to you. What else did you look at and read this week? All right. So first up, I read Fish Flies number three from Image, written by Jeff Lemire, with art by Jeff Lemire, and that's five ninety nine. Uh, it, it's oversized, uh, definitely some additional pages here. So the kid um, that the bug guy hurt is in the hospital in a coma. His mom is there. She's a troubled woman. She's definitely, you know, a, a drinker. People think she's a little crazy in town, and she's there with him. Danny the cop is trying to catch the guy who hurt the kid, but, you know, you and I know that the, uh, the guy has turned into a bug, uh, but they're still you know, kind of doing a APB out on the guy. Uh, and Fran, the, the little girl, is hiding him in the farm's silo. So the dogs have tracked the bad guy to the house, and Danny uh, asks Fran's dad what he knows. But her dad is another dr – he's a drunken jerk, and um, he also apparently – it's alluded to that he did some bad things to his wife, who is now gone. Uh, so who knows exactly what happened there. I think they're alluding to some pretty bad stuff. So – 
uh, Fran, you know, realizes the cop is here and they've tracked him, uh, tracked the bug guy to this farm. So Fran goes back and tells the bug guy that he has to leave because the police are here. But the bug guy isn't like grokking what she's up to. So she's got to throw rocks at him to get him to kind of scamper off into the woods. Fran's dad is upset at her. Where were you? Uh, oh, I was in the barn. No, you weren't. We were out in the barn. No, I was hiding. No, you weren't. You're a liar. Uh, so uh, Fran's dad goes to punish her, but her bug protector is back. Uh-oh. Dun-dun-dun. Uh, this is a slow-paced story. It's a quiet story, but still very effective. I like Lemaire's art. Um, it's very sparse and, um, you know, a little cr on the crude side, but it's it makes it very effective. It's, it's disarming art. Let me put it that way. I find that it's interesting that there's a lot of lying in this issue. Fran lies about where she's been. She's saying she's in the barn. Well, Danny was there and her dad lies about where he's been all day. He says, oh, I was at work. Where were you? And he's like, no, you weren't at work. You were home drinking. I like this book a lot. I really have no idea. I mean, I'm rooting for Fran. I'm, I'm not rooting for the bug guy, but they're friends. So I don't know who I'm really rooting for. I just hope Fran doesn't get hurt. And uh, it all works out in the end. So that is Fish Flies, number three. I also got uh, another book, Door to Door, Night from Night. And, and this was on the cover. It says number seven, but it's it's a double issue. And if you go to the, the staple page, it's uh, also number eight. Um, so there's a cover in the middle of the book here. And so there's two separate issues here. And they're the final two issues. Uh, I'm not too happy about this being ending. Um, I really like this book. Um and uh, I, I'm sad to see it go. And I'm not sure why. I know there was a big gap between um, a, a couple of the issues, but all of a sudden now we're getting two. It's like they're wrapping this up. And I don't understand because it's a good book. Um, so the gang, our, our, our photography salespeople, are driving to the next town where they see a hitchhiker along the side of the road with a guitar case. And his name is Johnny Rad. They pick him up. And uh, he's a solo singer guitarist. He used to have a band, but not anymore. And they ask him if he wants to join their group of uh, photography coupon salesman con artists. <laughs> and he agrees. So they tell him about the photo coupons and how they do the selling, but they don't tell him about the monsters they hunt. Uh, eventually, Johnny wonders why they're all going out at night, and they finally do have to tell him about the monsters. And he doesn't believe them, of course, until he sees a giant fawn monster. And, you know, there are reports of people being killed around here, and so these guys have gone out looking for the fawn monster, and there he is. But it turns out that this fawn monster isn't the one killing folks. It's his father. So they all hunt down and find and kill the bad fawn. And it turns out, though, that Johnny's guitar case isn't full of a guitar. It's full of money that he got robbing a poker game at their last gig. When they did it, it was like, it, you know, it was like a robbery that went bad. And his band and all the gamblers were killed. And Jan Johnny was the only survivor and took the money and got away. And it's all bloody and stuff. So he's been out, Johnny's out walking around and he's got a string, it's, he's followed by a dog that's like on fire, flaming. And he kind of runs and goes to a church where he meets the religious guy from the group, Cal, who also has secrets. We learn some of what Cal has been up to. Now, it turns out that only the guilty can see the dog and both of these two can see the dog <laughs> and they run out of the church because, you know, they make a scene and they're asked to leave and they do. And the dog finds them and they have to fight it. But they get some help. Still, something bad happens and, a you know, a sacrifice is made and something bad happens and we get a big loss. I don't know if there's open for more in this book or if this is truly the end. But I am really sad to see this book go. I, I love Vault Comics. Vault is probably my one of my absolute favorite publishers, but I think it's a little janky to put out two full issues like this in under one cover. I'm not sure if it was the sales didn't do well or what, but this is a book that I really liked and I could have hung with for a, quite a while. I like the characters. I like the setup. 
And I just feel like, you know, maybe they never committed to this book. And I, you know, th that this could have done more. And I don't, I think they didn't know what they wanted to do with it. But I enjoyed it very much because I enjoyed the characters that they, that uh, Bun wrote. And so I am going to be very sad to see this one go. So this was Door to Door, Night from Night, number seven and number eight. Uh, next up. The Cull, number four from Image, written by Kelly Thompson with art by Matea De Julius, and that's three ninety nine. So these kids, they were gonna, they told their parents they were gonna make a movie, so they left in the middle of the night and they went out to the beach and they found a cave and they went through the cave and the cave took them to a liminal space and gave them powers and they came back and the monsters followed them and they go to their houses and find that everyone is gone. Now, some of them are dead because the monsters killed them, and some of them are just hiding. So it turns out a lot of people are hiding. So these kids now have been granted these powers. Are they going to be able to use them to save their families? So that's a very brief recap. Um, there's a lot more talking going back and forth. I'm having a little trouble staying with the story. Uh, it, it's not the story that I'm having trouble with. It's, it's the characters. And it's like, what is everybody up to? It's like, I keep seeing their faces, but I can't remember what their problem is, you know, what their, what their vibe is. So I kind of have to rework this every time. I like it. I like the art. I like the concept of going into this liminal space and trying to find um, this one girl's um, missing brother. Uh, who's still missing, uh, but I, I, I'm starting to not understand where we're going and why we're going there. So I am I think I'm going to still hang in on this, but I'm getting a little scratchy. So that is The Cull, number four. And finally, I read Shutter Magazine, number 14 from Warrant Publishing, various artists and writers. Uh, Shutter Magazine is a magazine-sized uh, black-and-white anthology comic in the mode of worn books like uh, eerie and creepy. And in this issue, we get a man that is fattening up his new girlfriend for a visit to his family. And I think you probably all see this one coming already. Uh, and if you don't, you need to read more of this kind of thing. Uh, we also see a story with a guy that kills a Salvation Army Santa to steal the donation money. He hides the body in Santa's sack. But sometimes the dead don't stay dead, and then they end up on the cover of a horror magazine. Um, we get a story about a giant woman, a woman that protects vampires. Another one about a World War I story about a man who promises his family he will be home by Christmas, and he is, and I'm sure they wish he wasn't. Uh, we get the story of a young orphan that goes to live with her creepy family in the family mansion. Uh, things obviously go wrong there. And then we get a genie in the lamp tale. These are fun stories. They're light and breezy. If you don't like a story, just sit back. There's another one and another page or two. So don't worry about it. I dig Shutter Magazine and uh, I like this issue. So that was Shutter Magazine number 14. A couple other books we didn't quite get to. The Oddly Pedestrian Life of Christopher Chaos, number five from Dark Horse, written by Tate Bromble and Nick Robles, with art by Isaac Goodhart. And that's four ninety nine. Eerie Archives, volume two, trade paperback from Dark Horse, written by Archie Goodwin, with art by Various, and that's twenty four ninety nine. A Haunted Girl, number two from Image, written by Ethan Sachs and Naomi Sachs, with art by Marco Lorenzano, and that's four ninety nine. Geiger, Ground Zero, number one from Image, written by Jeff Johns, with art by Gary Frank, and that's $3.99. Rumpus Room, number three from AWA, written by Mark Russell, with art by Ramon Rosanas, and that's $3.99. And The Madness, number four of six from AWA, written by J. Michael Straczynski, and art by Echo, and that is $3.99. And as it seems to do almost, gosh, every seven days, it seems sometimes. Today is Wednesday. What books are you looking for this week, Chris? Well said, Professor. Thank you. <laughs> what I have includes, but is not limited to, Lunar Lodge, number one from Dark Horse Comics, written by Tyler Markaka and art done by Mirko Kolak. It's three ninety nine. dollars Mortal Terror, number one, is out today from Dark Horse Comics. Now, this one is written by Christopher Golden and Tom Tim Lieben, and art is done by Peter Bergting. It's four ninety nine. 
Next, we have Bryn Moore, number five from IDW Publishing, written by Steve Niles. Art Done by Damian Worm. It's $3.99. Bone Orchard Mythos, Tenement, number six, from Images Out Today, written by Jeff Lemire, art done by Andrea Sorrentino and Dave Stewart. It's $3.99. Hash, hack Slash Back to School, number two from Image Comics, is out, written by Zoe Thorgood, art done by mm. Zoe Thorgood. It's $3.99. And we also have Holy Roller, number one from Image Comics, written by Rick Remender and some guy named Andy Samberg. Yes, that Andy <laughs> Samberg. And Joe Troman, art is done by Roland Boshi, and it's $3.99. <laughs> Hang on. I know you're dying to get out there to get these and read these, but you need to know there are a few more out today, aren't there, Professor? There sure are. We have Radiant Black, number 26 from Image, written by Kyle Higgins and Joe Clark, with art by Marcelo Costa and Eduardo Ferragato, and that's $3.99. Universal Monsters, Dracula, number two from Image, written by James Tynan IV, with art by Martin Simmons, and that's $4.99. Kananan, number five from Ahoy Comics, written by Paul Cornell, with art by Marika Cresta, and that's $3.99. Conan the Barbarian, volume five, number three from Titan Comics, written by Jim Zub, with art by Roberto De La Torre and Dean White, and that's $3.99. Somna, a bedtime story, number one from Distillery Media, written by Becky Cloonan and Tula Lote, with art by Becky Cloonan and Tula Lote, and that's $8.99. Darkling, number one from Archie Comics, written by Sarah Q, and art by Carola Borelli, and that's $3.99. Plot Holes, number four or five from Mass of Whatnot, written and art by Sean Gordon Murphy, and that's $3.99. Void Rivals, number six from Image Comics, written by Robert Kirkman, with art by Lorenzo De Felici and Matthias Lopez, and that's $3.99. What do you think about this week's books, Chris? Thanks, Prof. Yeah, some beautifully rendered books, you know, with the Bone Orange okay. Tenement, and then we've got the Dracula book. Those are really, really going to be spectacular. I'm also intrigued by the Darkling book from Archie Comics, mm. because just seeing the cover alone, I was really intrigued by that. I'm not going to fall asleep on Plot Holes by Sean Gordon Murphy. I, this is a book that's growing on me, and I think it's a really, really Im an imaginative book. Uh, Void Rivals, I, I think I'm an issue behind on that, but I am enjoying what I'm liking there. Radio Black is sort of... Uh, I hate to say falling off my radar, but I'm sticking with it. And I think Kananon is the conclusion of that series. Again, that hasn't grabbed me as much as I thought it would, but it is still a, a decent read. Professor, your thoughts and impressions? Well, there's a lot of good books this week. Um, you know, definitely looking forward to Tenement. Um, I think that that's a, that's a really good book and uh, can't wait to, can't wait to uh, check that one out. Um, I am also looking forward to uh dracula of course i can't wait to hear that dracula book uh that if it, it continues that quality it's going to be this you know it may be my favorite of the year um a couple of number ones lunar lodge holy roller um darkling and mortal terror they you know some number ones sound good to me i need some some new blood in my in my uh in my collection here uh, a lot of books are ending I also added hack slash to this list. I realize it's number two um, and it's kind of the second hack slash art. I heard a lot of really, really good things about the first uh, arc. And then uh, last week we read a Zoe Thorogood book that I just loved. I think it's uh, the creep show book. And I thought it was fantastic. And I was like, huh, what else is she, uh, she up to? And uh, I see this hack slash thing is going on, and I think I'm going to get on it. So we'll see how that goes. I hope, uh, I hope that's as good as everybody talks about. Now, Spenguli, last Saturday, showed Empire of the Ants. What would you think about the movie, Chris? Professor, I remember actually seeing this one in the theater, so it brought back some oh. nostalgia vibes for me. Uh, as stated last week, I kind of wanted to see the Kingdom of the Spiders one, too. I don't know what the distribution was like, and if it, if it was in the Memphis area when it was played, I, I, it might not have been in a theater close to my place, and sometimes that sort of dictates the, <laughs> the geography of what you had. Sure. What I recall, what I didn't recall, pardon me, was just some of the supporting cast because I knew Joan Collins and Robert Lansing were in this. Mm -hmm. That said, I had forgotten. We also had Albert Salmi, a past Ooh, that yeah. guy, was in right. this. He played the sheriff. And we also had an actress named uh, Pamela Shoup, who was one of the Amazons in the uh, Feminine Mystique two-parter. Uh, she oh. was in that one. We had Robert Pine, who we last just saw in months... <laughs> 
Munster Go Home. He was in this, uh, Chris Pine's dad. I forgot he was in this as well. And we also had an actor named Harry Holcomb that I recognized, but I've forgotten that he was in this. He was best known as Whitey Whitney's dad in Leave it to Beaver, and he was also Mark Andrews in the Perfect Crime episode of Batman. So we really had a recognizable supporting cast here. What I enjoyed about this movie, though, was... It's it's not it's a little there's a little more substance to this than just the ants eating the radioactive stuff that falls off the boat that the guys are dumping you know <laughs> <and> that <laughs> that makes them giant and mutated okay f- fair enough and you think it's going to be an us versus them thing but there's a little more nuances and layers to this I like that the supporting cast has a lot more to do a lot more scenery to chew Robert mm. Lansing is basically this de facto boat captain who who's Hey, my job is just to get you to this island and, you know, get you back. That's all I'm paid for. He just plays this rough guy. And he's got a little bit more hair and he's got a little bit more of a weathered look with the beard. And I always liked it, Lansing, as an actor. I thought he always did a decent job with what he had. Joan Collins, is it's it's amazing to see her in this. But the premise of this thing is uh, it's a it's a fake real estate deal that they're trying to get these people to take them out to this place where there's worthless land and they do it up but it's it's a con and they're trying to hook him into buying this worthless property and i like the one guy who puts like there's when a guy discovers like there's fake pipe fixtures up in the ground so there's actually no plumbing on this place oh, but he gets he gets beaten he gets eaten with the with, with the ants with his wife and and poor uh harry uh holcomb his character does not fare well either along with his spouse played by irene tedrow uh, terrible terrible stuff but as if it's not an ants versus them thing. Then once they're rescued by Albert Salmi, he takes them back to the town. Now we get the creepy paranoia vibe. You know, people uh, can't get a, any communication out. Hmm, what's up with that? You know, and the, the, the mayor seems to be kind of, uh, here, just enjoy your stay. We'll make sure you, well, can we rent a car and get out of here? No, no, we need you to stay. Now you get the paranoia vibe, you know, and I like that. So now all of a sudden we get the paranoia vibe, like, is this invasion of the body snatchers? What's going on? Seems though, yeah, the, 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 the people that were rescued noticed there's this giant sugar refinery plant right outside the town. And who likes uh, sugar? Ants. ants. So the queen ant, the queen giant ant, <laughs> uses her pheromones to control the people and say, hey, we're not going to kill you. Just give, keep giving us the sugar. And she mm-hmm. basically takes these people into like this little chamber, sprays them, then they become controlled and pheromoned and then, then, then they act upon it. It has a it has a decent conclusion and it's another one of these seventies uh, nature will take over, take over the thing <laughs> with like we had back in the day. And I love me some seventies movies. What I did know also going into it that I guess, um, international pictures, uh, AIP also did like H D L films that included food of the gods in the yeah. Island of Dr. Moreau, uh. which I missed out both times seeing those movies. Be- and my mm. sister went to them food of the gods. I distinctly remembered. I had a cold to kill all. Co- this was like right in my personal <laughs> top 10 of colds. Oh, no. This was bad. I could not go see food of the gods cause I was laid up in bed. A year later, Island of Dr. Moreau comes out. My dad's going to take me and my sister. Who gets sick again? Me. Oh, I no. stayed in bed. I was just miserable. So she got to see Food of the Gods. She got to see Island of Dr. Moreau. And I said, did you like it? I loved it, she said. To make you feel better, I saw Island of Dr. Moreau in the theaters. And I was like, eh. Okay, fair yeah, enough. Wasn't as good as uh, the Charles Lawton version. Fair enough, fair enough. I, I it's just the outing and getting the popcorn Absolutely. too, though that you, that you miss out. I can. Well, I feel better now. Can you take me to the movie? Nah, you missed out. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those life things and stuff like that. But it brought back some nostalgia feels for me, and I I, I liked it. It's a good Spengoolie movie. I like nice. movies in the seventies. You and I can appreciate some of the. I appreciate the actors much, much more now looking at it from a different lens as a child from now, just to seeing all the stuff that they had to go through to endure this shoot. I'm sure some of the things were fun. Some of them must have been very unpleasant for for that. I applaud the cast and all the people. And I, I'm a sucker for some of these Bird Eye Gordon movies. And uh, yeah, I, I, I dug it. So hopefully, Professor, if you catch it, you may not be as thrilled or have the nostalgia vibes that I get, but uh, I, I think you'll like it for a Sven movie such as it is. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I didn't see it last night. Um, I, I was busy. I went to a local movie theater showing. Um, it was a double feature of Dracula's Daughter and Bride of Frankenstein. 
I had a great night. You know, they they talk about um, when we've seen Dracula's daughter on Sven. Sven always talks about you know that Gloria Holden who played Dracula's daughter. You know, they she tried not to blink, and they cut out all the blinks that she made. And you know, you watch it on a little television, and you say, yeah, I guess, I guess she is. But when you see it on the big screen, she's got these big eyes, and they don't blink. <laughs> it's definitely freaky. I saw a couple. Of, uh, there were a couple of things that I never saw before in Bride. Uh, and a, a couple of times the monster cries and he actually tears roll down the monster's cheek and it happens twice. And I never really noticed that in um, Bride of Frankenstein before. So it was definitely um, it, it was a, a great night of um, of horror movies at the Rosendale Theater. Next week, Spanguli is playing a movie that I've also seen at the Rosendale Theater, House on Haunted Hill. Great flick. Uh, I love that one. You like that one, Chris? I enjoy it. Great cast, uh, and I'm totally, totally waiting to see that one. I, it, it, how can you not like it? it oh, yeah. Marvelous cast, marvelous person. I like the way it starts, and uh, it, for Elisha Cook, really, really oh, good. Vincent yeah. Price, yeah, so this good. is this is going to be great. Yep, absolutely. Now, folks, don't forget we're putting up this podcast on YouTube. So if you're you know sitting around, you haven't had a chance to download the episode, but Gosh darn it, I want to hear some Professor Frenzy podcast. So uh, you can just go to YouTube, and you can find it on YouTube and uh, check it out there. So either way, we're in both places. Now, Chris, you know that guy? You know the guy that was in that show. He's that guy you know. He's that guy in the show. That guy in the show. Yes, we do. Professor and listeners, this is one that uh, has sort of been sort of waiting in the wings for mm. months, literally, because we've always had some suggestions and we're getting to some of your listener feedback and suggestions for that. We're greatly, greatly appreciative. Yes. That said, we've, we've had this guy in the hopper for a very, very long time. So I think just to kind of get him out of our Google Docs queue, we're finally going <laughs> to we're finally going to move on from him. And this is one that I thought of a long long time ago and we're finally so going to get good. to him it's james olson professor can you enlighten myself and the rest of the listeners about the very career of james olson you betcha james olson was born james olson hmm. <laughs> on october 8th 1930 in evanston illinois he graduated from Northwestern, went into the u.s army was a in the military police and he did some stage work around chicago so he started doing very well in theater and got onto Broadway. And some of the plays he was in was Of Love Remembered, Slapstick Tragedy, The Three Sisters, The Chinese Prime Minister, Romulus, JB, The Sin of Pat Muldoon, The Young and Beautiful. So some. then he was discovered and he was in a bunch of movies. He was in Shark Fighters, Rachel Rachel, The Strange One. The Three Sisters, The Stalking Moon, The Andromeda Strain, The Missiles of October, Ragtime, Amityville 2, The Possession, and Commando. Uh, he did a lot, a lot, a lot of TV, and uh, a couple of them. Uh, he was uh, in The Life of Mickey Mantle. He played Mickey Mantle, which is amazing. Uh, he was in Ironside, Murder, She Wrote, Little House on the Prairie. Hawaii Five-0, Battlestar Galactica, Lou Grant, The Bionic Woman, Wonder Woman, Mannix, Bonanza, Have Gun Will Travel, Marcus Welby, M.D., Police Woman, Barnaby Jones, The New Land, Columbo, Maud, The Virginian, Streets of San Francisco, Cannon, Jake and the Fat Man, Matt Houston, B.J. and the Bear, Battlestar Galactica, where he played Thane. The Bionic Woman, the court martial of George Armstrong Custer, and he played George Armstrong Custer. Um, Wonder Woman, Law and Order, Macmillan and Wife, Kung Fu, Harry O, the FBI, Police Story, The Magical World of Disney, and Route 66. That's a very varied career. He did a bunch of anthology television, too. He was in the Craft Television Theater, the Armstrong Circle Theater, Play of the Week. Playhouse 90, Matinee Theater, Robert Montgomery Presents, and The Craft Theater. Wow, what a career. Uh, he passed April 17th, 
2022 at the age of 91 years of age in Malibu, California. Chris, what are some of your memories of James Olson? Thanks, Prof. Yeah, this guy popped up everywhere when I was watching TV as a child, and I, I just thought, wow, the, you know, he never really had his own show, but what he did was very effective in whatever he appeared in. Uh, a few episodes, several episodes ago, I mentioned an anthology series called Insight, and I remember a particular episode where he played a doctor in that one that was with Bill Bixby in that particular episode. I thought he was very effective there. As listeners know, Hawaii Five-0 is one of my all-time favorite shows from back in the day, and he appeared in five episodes. I thought he was really effective in all of the, his parts he did, but I'll list three. that He appeared in an earlier episode called Bait Once, Bait Twice, well, well-written episode, mm. and he appeared in a, late, a couple later season episodes. One was called A Distant Thunder, where he played a neo-Nazi, and... This uh, episode pops up sometimes in reruns, but now when they show it, they basically have to give the little black title card saying some of the things that you see depicted here may be deemed offensive, but, you know, watch it with caution. So, yeah, really effective as the neo-Nazi in that one. Also appeared in a, I think this was the second to last or last season of Hawaii Five-0. He appeared in an episode called Labyrinth, where... He is a spouse got kidnapped, but there's a little bit more to this plot than meets the eye. And it was sort of like a they, they had like not just one twist, but two twists in this particular episode of Labyrinth. And some of these episodes of Hawaii Five O, for whatever reason, don't show up in reruns in the syndication package. But if you if you can find it, if it's part of a streaming services that you're on, don't fall asleep on some of the latter episodes of Hawaii Five O, particularly Labyrinth. I thought was a really really well written tight episode. Hmm. For fans of Little House on the Prairie, he appeared in an episode called The Faith Healer. Uh, and this is one where he shows up and he purportedly can cure people, <laughs> but so much so that when a child in town of Walnut Grove needs to have his appendix out, they basically said, well, we'll see The Faith Healer. Guess what? It doesn't work out. The boy dies. But oh. it turns out, you know, they're going to keep The Faith Healer and run the doctor out of town. But Charles discovers that he pulls this con in the next town over where somebody actually purportedly is healed, and then Charles pulls the rug out from under this guy, and he, mm. we get to see him uh, exposed for what he really is. Really, really some of those clever latter episodes of Little House on the Prairie actually kind of held up a mirror to contemporary stuff. There was an episode that looked at the fast food craze. There was an episode, and you, you, don't, you wouldn't think, how could Little House do it? But yet they found a way to do it. They looked at the fast food craze. They looked at uh, faith healers. Another one look, took a shot at tabloids as well. So, you know, Little House, don't fall asleep on that. And I thought Olsen really was effective as this purported faith healer. Wonder Woman, he appeared in season one in an episode called Last of the $2 Bills, where he pay, played a formidable villain called Wotan. And Columbo fans, he appeared in the episode Etude in Black. And it doesn't get more 70s than this, folks. He appeared in the two-part episode of Bionic Woman, Fembots in Las Vegas. Now, you can't... Awesome. I mean, that, that is some range. I mean, to do, be in all of these classic 70s TV series is, is a wonder. So I think it's a real, real great, great salute when... You, I mean, if the guy appeared in Fembots in Las Vegas, I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is good. Totally. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, you, that, that, that's the penultimate right there. Okay, so... Can't beat that. Can't beat that. So... <laughs> Great, great stuff with uh, the talented uh, James Olsen, who got around back in the day. Absolutely. So this week's That Guy in That Show is James Olsen. He's that guy you know. He's that guy in the show. That guy in the show. Now it's time to check out our frenzy faves. Not just another Tom Dick or Dave. These are our frenzy Okay. Well, Professor, here's a, here's one for you. We've got on this particular episode something that's a bit timely, and it's what our favorite Thanksgiving foods are. Great, great call, Prof. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So the, do you, everybody's got you know their own um, you know traditions and and things around Thanksgiving and the holidays. Um, you know, so for mine, we would all go over to my you know usually my parents or my mom's house. And, uh, she, you know, she would do most of the cooking. Now this, now we're going over to my sister's cause you know, the Turkey is getting a little heavy. Uh, There's a lot of people. So we need somebody that can lift the Turkey. So that'll be, that's my sister. Um, so yeah. Do you have any special traditions around uh, Thanksgiving, Chris? 
No, not necessarily. I, I, you know, we do like the family does parade watching in the morning, well, yeah. and uh, of course, Detroit Lions football. And oh yeah, we'll, we will do that, and the Dallas Cowboys, of course, also play. Now the NFL has included, I think, three games at, at mm. this point. So, yeah. Uh, I think I think ours are you know pretty much conventional, but I, I would say the parade viewing and the Detroit Lions football game are, are, are must. How about you? Yeah, well, we we definitely um, you know you'll have the parade on. Maybe you won't be sitting around watching it, and um, we've always watched the Lions um, and the other teams. They always seem to, to me. I realize a lot. Of, you know, Cowboys have been playing on Thanksgiving a while, but it always seems to me that the Lions is the the Thanksgiving team. I don't know. You, I know you're a Lions fan, but I, and you, I assume you feel the same way. Um, but it must be kind of disappointing when all those other teams started doing it too. In, in a sense. Yeah. I think the NFL got tired of like the Lions being perennial, perennial losers and why should they always get the spotlight? But you know, it's tradition and here we are. Uh, just another little side note too, you know, with the parade viewing, I think some, depending on where you live, you might get local coverage of a local parade. Mm -hmm. That said, I remember back in the day, and I don't know how long CBS was doing it, but I remember as a child, CBS would cover New York, and then they mm -hmm. would also cover, I think, Philadelphia. Oh. And I think they covered either Toronto, I want to say Toronto. They went to Toronto mm -hmm. for whatever, and I don't think Toronto had a Thanksgiving parade in the sense that we had. <laughs> And they also went to Detroit, and they also covered a uh, parade in Honolulu. So oh. you had multiple coverage, and you take a couple of uh, stars that were on the CBS show, and you pair them together as the commentators. Oh, yeah. And one of my memories was always hearing Sherman Hemsley saying, Happy Thanksgiving, and just the way Sherman Hemsley said it, you know? Because I don't know if he was in Philly or Detroit or wherever they put, you know, the CB respective CBS star. You know, and I like that they covered, you know, different cities across you know, the, the, country, the, the country. Yeah. That was really cool. Whereas NBC totally stayed with New York's Macy's, you know, and that's, that's fine. You know, I, I, with respect to that. And the one year, the one year we went as a family to uh, Detroit for Thanksgiving, they had it on the Macy's parade. And I'm thinking, no, put it on, Wait. put it on CBS. Don't <laughs> leave it on channel four. And said, no, no, we watched channel four here. Oh man, because they're because right. I didn't want to see all the Broadway. Yeah. As a little kid, when I was like you know seven or eight, I didn't appreciate the Broadway shows because they trot out. No, you're supposed to be on a float. You move down the street. That's a parade. You don't stop in the middle of the street <laughs> and do a sing show. a so from a Broadway show and and then because if what if you're what if you're sitting what if you're two blocks away you miss yeah. out the parade yeah. moves on so everybody can see what's happening you 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 know and I'm thinking. You're, you're hosed if you're two blocks away from this thing, you know, the, you know, to see that. Now, as I grow, grew older, I got to appreciate the Broadway stuff. I got to see, oh, what's, what's, what's the hot show now? Now they're going to do a number of it. And then you see some really stupid uh, lip syncing from some team pop idol. Yeah. And I always got to see who the worst lip syncers were on these things, <laughs> on these floats. So I got to appreciate that. And you had the Rock Cats, which are always nice. So, sure. so I grew to have an appreciation more towards the NBC Macy's coverage. And I think CBS all but dropped. I don't know if they thought this is too much hassle, you know, try, you know, the, the, our celebrities want to have a day off. They don't. And you, can you imagine if you're, if you're a CBS star back in the seventies, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Are you going to spend Thanksgiving at home? No, no. Nope. Nah, the network wants me to go to Detroit. Oh, lucky you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just, uh, or go to Philly or go to Hawaii. Maybe the Hawaii gig must've been good. I think they always, but the, oh, since yeah. Jack Lord was there anyway, I think they usually had Jack Lord for the Hawaii one. <laughs> so, cause he was already there. He's so, there. Yeah. yeah. Save, <laughs> Why save somebody? some money. Yeah. Save some money. So, but yeah, that had to be, a tough putt if you were a celebrity you wanted thanksgiving with your family then you had a gig where you had to go oh, to the, cover well, i gotta cover the parade and they've got to get up at four you know so but I, I think i think they just basically both stay out with new york and uh mm. yeah so I, I i appreciate it i i've had more appreciation as i've grown older to see the broadway shows yeah well, are, yeah yeah we we used to go to the not all the time but a handful of times we would go to the um um the macy's parade how cool is that? To be yeah, there well, you know, I'm not a parade person, okay. and um, it's cool with the floats, and you know, seeing all the the underdog and all that stuff. Um, <laughs> I do have a story. I was there with my son. My my daughter was too young; she was just born. And I went to my dad took us, drove us down to the city, um, and dropped us, and kind of he went home, and we were going to take the train. Um, back and now my son is you know two years old or three years old or something 
And we were watching the parade. You know, we, we just got there, and, and my dad drives off. And he said, uh, where's Grandpa going? I said, oh, he's going home. And he goes, oh, is he going to come back to pick us up? And I said, no, we are going to take the train back, back home. And he said, we're going to take a train. I want to go on the train now. And I was like, we just got here. Here's the parade. Let's watch the parade. And then, you know, I want to go on the train. I want to go on the train. Um, it was, uh, it was uh, a very short parade because he just, you know, he, he wasn't that interested. And we got on the train. We are on the way back. And, uh, you know, people dress up on the train on Thanksgiving. And this woman was wearing a, um, a mink coat. Big, big mink coat, black mink coat. Mm. And uh, my son <laughs> looked at her and he said, Dad, why is that lady wearing a gorilla costume? And where's the head? <laughs> so that uh -oh. lady was not <laughs> oh, very no. pleased to hear that. <laughs> so she was insulted, but everybody else laughed. So that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah what are you going to do? Um, okay, so those are some of my Thanksgiving stories. Chris, what are some of your honorable mention favorite things at Thanksgiving? I have to apologize to you and the listeners before I get into that, because inevitably what happens when I compile a list is I forget something from the previous week. So let me get some clear some oh, business yeah. here. Some leftovers from the last show when we talked about our favorite LPs from back in the day. I, I Sure enough, as soon as the show ended, I forgot a couple. Uh, Van Halen's yeah. debut album. Now, I could have... Van Halen, gosh, you know, right yeah, place yeah. at the right time as a kid, you know, the, the, just as they're finding their own and coming on the scene is right when I'm discovering music. So Va Van Halen's mm. debut album had Running With The Devil, You Really Got Me, which is the cover of The Kinks, and Jamie's Crying. Ah, oh, my gosh, you know, Great. Really, really good stuff there. Yeah, uh, and I remember that uh, that uh, You Really Got Me version. I think last week I talked about, uh, you know, coming home for after school and taking a nap with the radio on and hearing... Uh, Pink Floyd, Comfortably Numb. That same thing happened with You Really Got Me. The um, You know, I was really familiar with the Kinks version, um, but I was in, you know, a half sleep, and I hear You Really Got Me, but it's wild and guitar crazy, and what is this? And I wake up, and that was it. And I've loved that, that version of that song ever since. Yep, yep. And then uh, maybe... A little too commercial, but I also wanted to include 1984 by Van Halen because it had oh, Hot yeah. for Teacher, Panama, mm -hmm. Jump, I'll Wait, which is my favorite track from that particular album. And another one I forgot, I forgot the Eagles. How could I forget the Eagles with respect to that? So I chose Hotel California, which had, of course, the song Hotel California, New Kid in Town, and Life in the Fast Lane. And for, I don't know if you did this move when you were a kid, but sometimes albums, you know, for a kid cost some money. So there were some mm. times where me, my sister, who's close to me in age, would combine our allowances to get an album you know saturday mm. night fever was one of those uh hotel california was another okay yeah because we had purple rain there was sometimes we you know we had different tastes but there were some we mutually agreed on we also cobbled together to our, our combined uh financial sums of money to get the soundtrack for Greece. Now, however, we sent our dad out to get it and we, that was a big mistake because he comes mm. back and we look at it and did you ever, I don't know if you had this move, Professor, one, did you ever like combine your forces with your siblings or your taste varied? And two, did he ever bring back like a copy? In other words, this was like another, this was like sort of like a studio band that was singing the album, you know? And, and he brings this back and it's like, it's the Grease soundtrack, but it's like a bunch of studio artists. It's not the real oh. artist that did it. And it was like, hey, I saved you guys a couple of bucks by buying this one. And it's like, see, it's got the same songs on it. And and we we looked at him, we looked at it, and this is, no, no we, we sent him back. <laughs> just <in the> receipt. <laughs> this is not, you know. But I can't begin to tell you this was a thing, you know, back in the day with, with, with records where they would take the popular one. And I don't know how long this lasted, but they make like a copy. Some studio artists would sing it. And sometimes you'd see this if you pop up in like, let's say, a... Um, a truck stop, like the, the Jerry Sings or whatever, like the, 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 a version of like, you know, country, today's country hits, you know, but it's not by the original artist, you know. So this was an album of Grease, but it was not by the original artist. And we were just were like, we were just so disappointed. We didn't want to tell our dad like, yeah, we really, your heart's in the right place. You saved us a couple bucks, but we want the original, you know, with respect to that. And I also remember too, uh, Professor, I don't know if you remember this too, and I don't want to get sidetracked with this because we 
we're on a different topic, but all these being uh, packaged in shrink wrap and they sort of had like a card back backer board and you could buy like a 45, you know, with like oh. some of those oldies back in the day too. So those brought back some memories. Awesome. Okay. Well, we move on to my honorable mentions for Thanksgiving food. Cranberry sauce. Yes, I don't care if it's in a can or the other stuff, but mm. you cannot fall asleep on the tart flavor that cranberry brings out in the Thanksgiving meal. Uh, yam and sweet potatoes, fine. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not a mac and cheese guy, but if, if you're, if, okay. hey, if you want your comfort food, I'm not going to say, you know, I'm not for me, but if that's your thing, have at it. I, I totally get it. Sure. Not, not for me, though. I'm going to include pizza because, you know, mm -hmm. if you're watching the football game, you kind of need that appetizer to kind of get your, you know, mm. metabolism going a little bit here, getting the food ready. You know, I, <laughs> hey, just, just, you know. Warm up the stomach. Warm, warm up the stomach. Exactly. You know, yeah. maybe some cold cuts and everything in respect oh. to that. And it didn't make it, but I am going to say, depending, if you call it stuffing, if you call it dressing, I don't care, but that's going to be an honorable mention because that's a good staple. Some people just really go all out with it. And I, it's something that I didn't appreciate as a kid, but I, as I, as I got older, yeah, the stuffing, the dressing, dressing, the stuffing, however, whatever you want to say. I, I like to say, <laughs> I did, when I was a kid, it was dressing, then people said stuffing. And now, now I'm going back to dressing because I like, I like, you know, call it dressing. So that's it. So professor, what are your honorable mentions? All right. So some of my honorable mentions, first, I'm going to come up with the pie category. Um, I like pumpkin and apple. Those are my favorites. I'll, I also uh, enjoy mince pie on Thanksgiving. It's just a different kind of a tangy flavor. It's a little less sweet. Um, in terms of yams uh, or sweet potatoes or yams, uh, no marshmallows on mine, please. Uh, I just like them straight up. I know a lot of people like, uh, you know, like, that's, like them very, very sweet, but that's not my um, not what I like particularly. I like the fall vegetables. That's really the highlight for me of, um, of Thanksgiving is all the different vegetables like turnip and all that stuff. I love, I love those, those flavors. Um, now, these aren't foods, but this is television. The Lions. I mentioned that already. I'd love to watch The Lions. Everybody else, meh. Uh, Macy, Macy's day parade. So, um, I know we talked about that a little, but, uh, they used to, they would play it on, um, uh, channel 11 WPIX and it would just be, you know, the parade and, you know, all weekend and you see whatever. Um, also we would, uh, often watch miracle on 34th street, which is a famous, uh, has the Macy's parade in it. And that was a good day to watch that. And also maybe not on Thanksgiving day, but um, usually on the weekend, usually by Sunday, Thanksgiving Sunday, I uh, like to watch March of the Wooden Soldiers, that Laurel and Hardy movie where they uh, have to fight the bogeyman. Uh, that was also on uh, Channel 11 WPIX on the weekend. So those are some of my favorite things to remember about Thanksgiving. All right, Chris, what's number three on your list of favorite things about Thanksgiving? Okay. Well, you know, on my plate, I want a green vegetable. I just put the word green. So you could put a green bean casserole. Oh, yeah. You could put just green beans. You can put mm. peas. You can put Brussels sprouts. You could put asparagus. Just so long as I have some green on my plate, I'm not picky, but I want something green there. So that's number three for me. <laughs> Professor, what's number three for you? Okay, I've got a weird one. Number three is creamed mm. onions. So now this isn't something that gets made often because creamed onions have to be made at the last minute, right? As you're about to go out onto, you know, put them out onto the dinner table. Uh, you know, everybody's sitting around the table and, you know, somebody's working on gravy and somebody's working on creamed onions. And uh, it was just, it, the problem is, is that everybody likes gravy. Not everybody likes creamed onions, so eh, they get loft, left off the plate sometime, and that's why they're my number three favorite because I don't always get them. <laughs> uh, I love onions. Onions are, you know, my favorite food in the world probably, so creamed onions will work too. All right, Chris, what's your number two favorite thing about Thanksgiving? Mm, mashed potatoes, please. Now, for me, oh. here, okay, if I have to have some type of quibble, I don't want them too hard, nor do I want them too soft and leaky. I want them just mashed enough so it's able to contain my little reservoir of gravy. And I'm going to put yeah, my gravy in there so I have an equal 
potato to gravy ratio. Okay, so Ooh. it's a little it's a little trick yeah, that I mastered even at a young age. You know, I, I just to have it there. But sometimes the mashed potatoes are too hard that you can't cobble together and shape your own little mm. trough. You know, and sometimes oh, yeah, they're so yeah. sometimes they're whipped so much that it leaks through. You need to have the right oh, consistency no. with the potato, but. Please, I have to have some mashed potatoes with a little dash of salt, and I am a happy camper. Professor, what's number two on your list? Number two on my list is I'm I'm about to hear a whole bunch of people listen, you know, that are listening to this podcast go, ooh. I love parsnips. Mm. So parsnips are like a, you know, a root vegetable, kind of like turnips. Um, they're a little sweet, they're a little a little spicy sometimes. They can be a little sour, a little tangy. Um, and it's one of those uh, vegetables that really I only get on Thanksgiving. So uh, it's definitely got a Thanksgiving uh, effect on me. All right, Chris, your top favorite thing about Thanksgiving. I just put meat. <laughs> Simple as that. All right. Yeah, you know, yeah, go cake, meat. turkey, but you know, if you have ham, mm -hmm. I'm not going to complain. Yeah. I honestly won't nope. say, you know, boy, the birds were so expensive this year. We went the cheap run, got a ham. Okay. You know, sure. the holidays are stressful enough. You can give, I'm just yes. a meat and potatoes guy. Give me turkey, give me meat, yeah, ham. I am a happy guy. No fuss, no muss, Absolutely. you know, just make a little plate and I'm good to go. <laughs> there it is. And, I'll leave it at that. That's a great yeah, you know what right more there. can I say? <laughs> I, I, I got the lines on, and if, if knock on wood, hopefully they will win. But if, but if, if I can't have the lines win, at least I I'll have a nice you know meal. You know, so there it is. Absolutely. I don't have more to say, Professor. What's your number one? My number one favorite food at Thanksgiving is the turkey sandwich the next day. Um, you know, I lo I love a turkey sandwich. White bread, mayo, salt and pepper, turkey, white white turkey, you know, sliced pretty thin, uh, stuffing, and cranberry sauce. Now you mentioned, Chris, you didn't you didn't mind which kind of cranberry sauce. I generally don't mind either, but I definitely like prefer the cheaper stuff, the stuff without the stuff inside that's just comes in a can and you know has the outline of the can mm -hmm. and everything, you know, no no, and putting that on a turkey sandwich. I would almost rather have the turkey sandwich than the turkey. Mm. So, wow. So that's Thanksgiving's coming up and uh, just a couple of days away. Well, for folks listening to the podcast, it may be tomorrow. So happy Thanksgiving, Chris. Happy Thanksgiving. And to our listeners, happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. So those are our favorite Thanksgiving foods. Not just another are our okay, well, Professor, you put the following on social media this past week. Attention, this is not a test. I repeat, mm. not a test of the Professor Frenzy Show podcast alert system. Important info on comics, classic actors, and music can be found below. Please proceed to the nearest podcast listening station and press play. Well, thank you so much, Professor. <laughs> and to our, our listeners who chimed in with some comments. First, we heard from Randy over at Soundtrack Alley on Soundtrack Alley. He said, press that button, pull that lever. Yes, bring on the comics. Bring on the music. It's the Professor Frenzy Show. Oh, thank you so much. Not to be outdone, <laughs> he comes at us again on the handle at Randall Andrews 1. How, how do I work this thing? Uh, press the button there, pull this lever here. Hmm. Oh, wait. It says right here, listen to the Professor Frenzy Show. Thank you so much. Our friend Clinton awesome. over at Coffee Comics BLG. This is it, folks. The bombs are falling. Aliens have invaded. The dead have risen and are feasting upon the living. Wait, wait. <laughs> Strike that. It was just a propensity frenzy siren going off again to let us know that it's Wednesday. It's time for another Professor Frenzy show. Thank you so much. It's well done, Clinton. Love Thank it. you. Our buddy Joey Galvez at Joey Galvez 1984. Oh my God. Professor Frenzy show is on. Oh my God. It's happening. If any, put a gift from the office of with Michael. That was really, really nice. Thank you so much, Joey. We appreciate that. And we also heard from uh, at Cat Victory. Wow. <laughs> yes, I had a TV in my car when I was a kid. Not all the time, just for those long road trips from Memphis to Detroit. Awesome. Yeah, my a little it was black and white. It was a very tiny screen, but my dad plugged it into the uh, ashtray with and, we got to if we passed through a big city we got to watch it the, the memorable ones that i remember watching were the um uh the episode of the monsters where herman uh 
is on the ham radio and he thinks he's talking to an alien, but it turns out to be a kid playing astronaut outside. And the odd Uh, couple episode, I remember distinctly watching the odd couple episode where uh, Felix uh, Oscar has to recreate the uh, radio broadcast with the Babe Ruth story where he's got the little kid in the hospital that with the sound effects there. I just think I could remember the watching those things on, on on a road trip. Yes. (laughs) I was a little bit spoiled. I must say back in the day, but we, but it was a long car ride and my boy were my legs cramped, but uh, at any, at any rate, (laughs) he says here about this and other exciting stuff on the professor fancy show podcast. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Also had a comment from uh, Don Goodnight on YouTube. Great show. James Spader is a versatile actor to great works. Mm -hmm. I gave away a treasure trove of vinyls to a DJ friend. Oh, wow. Worth a lot of money. Hell Mm. no. But I was moving, so I was tired of it. Uh, Too many to list. A little over a thousand. Wow. Can you imagine? Wow. Kept his 45s, though. And some from the 40s and up. Ready for the ants? I will be there. Yeah, Professor. Oh, yeah. 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 We talked about vinyls, but did you have a pretty good 45 collection? Uh, no, no, I didn't. I had a couple and I still, I think the only one I have left is the immigrant song. Um, it's the only 45 I have left, I think. Mm. Um, but no, I didn't, I didn't get too many 45s. I was an album guy. Yeah. Um, my sister's first 45 was ballroom blitz by sweet. And on the B side Mm. had a great song. It was a studio version of restless. And I, I I cannot find that to save my life. I I think the bell, the, the 45 is still somewhere in a box, but restless don't fall. Everybody loves ballroom blitz by sweet, uh, little Willie fine, but don't fall asleep on a song called restless boy. It it is, it, it is a great song. And I would love to love to hear the studio version of that again. And you know what? 45 I did have. Oh yeah. Afternoon delight. <laughs> I wonder what the B side of that was because that's the only song I, I know that remember. Sterling Vocal Band did. So that's really cool. Oh, that's awesome. I'm going to have to find that out. I'm going to have to see what, yeah, what, ask, what was the B side of Afternoon delight? <laughs> I want to hear that now. So. They just played the A side again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, we got some likes and retweets. Now, over on threads, we heard from uh, Dark Longbox at Longbox of Darkness. Mad Shelley Comics at Mad Shelley Comics. Uh, we heard from uh, DS May Collins. Thank you very much. We heard from Don at uh, Garen and Ruth. Thank you. Trick or Talk at Trick or nice. Talk. Uh, we heard from Ed over at Blue Sky. Thank you very much. And I uh, want to give a nice uh, shout out to our, the mascot of our show, Robin at Robin031. Robin, who is still recuperating. Yeah. And once again, our thoughts and prayers from the Professor Frenchie Show family go out to you. We also heard from our friend uh, at Joey Galvez, 1984. We also heard from Cat Church at Cat Victory. We heard from Zazen Zabi at T-Bear at 10. Our friend at Greg Litchfield. Greg has been a comic book reader and collector for 52 years. He reviews comics on a concise wow. scale from one to five. Not only contemporary material, even goes far back as the Silver Age. We heard from our friend Ed. Ed, so many things you do over at Teal Productions. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dance Fever, Lords of Order with Dr. Fate, the Mighty Thorcast that you do with Terry, News from Commando, Ronan Rabbit, Superman Super Show with Steven. Oh, good, good, good stuff. I want to give a shout out to Randy over at Randall Andrews One with the sketches and the podcast that he does. A couple of episodes just dropped too you want to check out. And they can be found at Soundtrack Alley. Now those are podcast where randy looks to see how music enhances a film experience two sleeps a two sleeps music want to give you a nice shout out my friend uh check yeah. out the patreon check out the music platform also performs concerts on twitch tv at 2 30 central 3 30 eastern check your local listings and you will not be disappointed with the musicianship and the fun kinship with fun banter that you have in the audience great interaction great times at two sleeps oh yeah Coleman Miller at HCMV007. Nice. Thank you very, very much for your support. And Jeff Whitmer at uh, Jeff Whitmer1. Oh, uh, and let's see. We also had at Rick's Rambles, Fine Fine Podcast. We also had the Bearded oh, yeah. Max on Mind of Horrors at Chris Cartagena 8. Check out all the horror projects, including the most recent one. And the Relatively Geeky Podcast Network. That would be Professor Allen. Professor Allen, yeah, good, good stuff. And don't fall asleep on what he's doing over there. You can find the feed at relatively underscore geek short box showcase quarter of podcast, the comics reading journal and more. Don't forget doom speak. I also heard from Tom Servo and drag. And I think that's everyone. If I overlooked you, my sincerest and deepest apologies, please let me on Twitter at Vito and Bapix, or let the professor himself know at professor frenzy. Be sure to mention you on our next show. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you for listening to The Professor Frenzy Show. You can find our podcast if you do an iTunes search for The Professor Frenzy Show. You can listen to the show on Twitter and find me on Twitter at Professor Frenzy and Chris at BTO and Bat Books. Hey, we're on Facebook over the Professor Frenzy Show page. We're on Instagram at Professor Frenzy. We're now also on Amazon Music, and we are now also on YouTube. Just visit YouTube.com slash Professor Frenzy, all one word. We are now also on TikTok, so go to Professor Frenzy 2 to see our videos. If you have an Android phone, the Professor Frenzy Show is part of the free network. Just swipe right on your homepage and look in the art section of the podcast list. Whatever device you use, you can subscribe to our podcast feed by doing an iTunes search for Professor Frenzy. Thank you for listening to the Professor Frenzy Show. Let us know on Twitter what you think about our show, and please help us get the word out to people that might like these kinds of comics. Thanks to everyone for listening. We look forward to chatting more about comics next week. And please remember, pick up your poll. Professor Frenzy. Professor Frenzy. All original content of the Professor Professor Frenzy Frenzy Show is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution, no derivatives, 3.0, unported license. Professor Frenzy. You are on the Frenzy Feed.